for many reasons. Um, one of the reasons is there's so much le there's so many less women in jails than there are men, which means that these prisons are further away from their homes. So they don't have they're much more isolated. They don't have contact with their children, with their families, uh, and with supports. Um, also, because uh, programming in prisons is basically been designed by a patriarchal system, the programming is directed toward men and by men. So a lot of the programs for women are domesticating programs. They're very um, geared towards, you know, women's work. Um, and uh, so there's also... Um, some people will say that there is an alternative in Bill S. It used to be Bill S. 10. Now it's the drugs. It's the drug part of this act. Uh, there's one good exception, which is that if the if the uh, person who is uh, charged with the crime agrees to go to drug treatment court, then they'll be able to um, not be sentenced under the man mandatory minimum penalty. But I don't think that also counts if you are if you're con convicted of a drug related crime so there's a lot of crime that's drug related so if you're an addict what are you doing to feed your addiction you might be uh, in the sex trade you might be stealing you might be whatever you're doing okay there's multiple things you might be doing to get your drugs and they don't take that into account um, I don't think uh, I don't, I'd like to actually look into that, but I, I don't think that that's that they do take that into account. And in the drug treatment courts, it's been found that women don't do as well. So that type of program is also geared towards uh, treating men with addictions. It's not geared towards women. So women tend to fail out of that program, and then they are sentenced under the mandatory minimum, or they will be. Um, just to give you some statistics on women, most women in prison in Canada are under the age of 35. 80% of women in prisons have been abused at some point in their lives, 80% of them, uh, and were unemployed when they com committed the crime. So this is just speaking to some of those social determinants of health, right? We, we know that uh, the more traumatized an individual is in their childhood, um, the more likely they are to have serious addictions to the most harmful drugs, okay? Uh, the more like, you know, when you find, I work with street addicts and almost all of them have had very, very traumatic uh, childhoods, okay? They, they didn't end up there out of their own choice. They didn't have supports to carry them through this life. And we're talking, you know, uh, some of my groups have six out of eight men grown men, handsome men, you know, like, who don't look like they're street addicts, who have been sexually, identify as being sexually abused as children. Um, so, if you wonder what leads someone to be a street addict, uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but uh, it's not, it's not always by choice. It's mostly due to uh, the traumatic experiences. So here's something interesting, sex relate, when we talk about sex related crimes, because a lot of women who are in the sex trade are also addicted to drugs, so that's how they feed their addiction. 32% um, of females convicted of prostitution offenses were sent to jail, while only 9% of men with the same conviction were sent to prison. I don't know why, but that is the statistic of people charged and convicted, okay? Um, and then also men and women have similar drug-related offenses, so a similar number of men and women have drug-related offenses, and, but women have tw uh, were sent to prison 26% of the time, and men uh, were sent to prison only 20% of the time at the time of that survey. So the point is, uh, when we're talking about women, is that mandatory minimum penalties leads to inequitable out outcomes for women, uh, since equal time served has different implications for them. Anyone want to add to that about women, specific? Um, the second one is 
harm reduction 